This video is presented to you by Physics for Students. To know more, please visit us at physicsforstudents.com. Dear friends, my name is Debalina and I'm your host for this podcast, The Saint of Mathematics. Welcome to the second episode. In the last episode, we looked into the childhood of Grigory Perelman, his family and his growing talent in mathematics. We ended up telling that success is the only axiom in his life. But in order to understand the present, we need to look back to the past. We need to understand our glories so that we can look at what is coming tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty deaths out, out brief candle life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing Ari Poacari was born on April 29, 1854, in Nancy, a town in the Lorraine County in France. He was born in the Hotel Martini, an apartment building, which still exists at the corner of Gare de Vaux and Rue de Guige. Today, this building has transformed into a drugstore. Poincaré's family was well known in Lorraine. His grandfather, on the father's side, Jacques Nicole, was a pharmacist. His father, Léon, a neurologist, a professor at the Faculty of Medicine, and his uncle, Antony, graduated from École Polytechnique. He was an inspector of roads and bridges, and he had two sons, Lucien and Raymond. The first was to be a physicist and then a rector of the University of Paris. Raymond was a prime minister and minister of foreign affairs and then the president of the French Republic between 1913 and 1920. In 1895, Ari Poincaré's younger sister, Eline, married the famous moral philosopher Émile Boutrou, with whom Poincaré used to discuss philosophical problems. Their son, Pierre, was a mathematician and philosopher. Ari's mother, Eugène Lenoir, came from a family of gentlemen farmers in Arancy. She was 24 years old when Ari was born, and he resembled her in several physical characteristics. His sister's son was a gifted mathematician. As a mathematician and physicist, Poincaré made many original fundamental contributions to pure and applied mathematics, mathematical physics and celestial mechanics. Early in 20th century, he formulated the Poincaré conjecture that became over time one of the famous unsolved problems in mathematics. On 20 April 1881, Ari Poincaré married Louise Poulian Dundigi, whom he had met while he was employed at the University of Caen. They had four children, Jeanne, born in 1887, Yvonne, born in 1889, Henriette, born in 1891, and Leo, 
born in 1893. Sometime in June 1912, Paul Cardi underwent successful surgery for a prostate problem. Thereafter, he apparently made a good recovery. On 17 July 1912, as he was dressing to go out for the first time post-operation, he suddenly died of an embolism. He was 58 years old at the time of his death. Well, that was in short something about Adi Poikari. At the beginning of the 20th century, when he was working on the foundations of topology, what would later be called combinatorial topology, and then algebraic topology. He was particularly interested in what topological properties characterized a sphere. Imagine a piece of rope so that, firstly, a knot is tied in the rope and then the ends are glued together. This is what mathematicians call a knot. A link is a collection of knots that are tangled together. If we stretch a rubber band around the surface of an apple, then we can shrink it down to a point by moving it slowly, without tearing it, and without allowing it to leave the surface. On the other hand, if we imagine that the same rubber band has somehow been stretched in the appropriate direction around a doughnut, then there is no way of shrinking it to a point without breaking either the rubber band or the doughnut. We say the surface of the apple is simply connected, but that the surface of the doughnut is not. Poincaré, almost a hundred years ago, knew that a two-dimensional sphere is essentially characterized by this property of simple connectivity and asked the corresponding question for the three-dimensional sphere. Poincaré asked this question, if a three-dimensional shape is simply connected, is it homeomorphic to the three-dimensional sphere? To make progress, topologists reached for a tool they had neglected, a way to specify distance. They set about recombining topology with geometry. In 1982, William Thurston, now of Cornell University, theorized that every 3D space can be carved up so that each piece has a unique uniform geometry and that those geometries come in only eight possible types. This hypothesis became known as the geometrization conjecture. If we want to understand an object that occurs in some problem and we have a classification result for that type of object, we can use it to gain traction on the problem. For example, we use the classification of semi-simple Lie algebras or the classification of finite simple groups all the time. The Poincaré conjecture is part of a similar classification effort, but for closed three manifolds. Now, closed two manifolds have a well-understood classification in a few senses. There is a topological classification, and there is also a geometric classification. These classification results allow us to tackle many problems involving surfaces, such as the Riemann surfaces which occur when one analytically continues a holomorphic function. So, it is natural to look for a corresponding classification result in higher dimensions. The topological classification of surfaces shows in particular that a surface is determined up to a homeomorphism by its integral homology, so it's natural to ask whether the same is true for three manifolds. Unfortunately, it's not. 
There is a famous example of a three manifold with the same homology as a sphere but which is not homeomorphic to it. One way to prove this is to show that it has a non-trivial fundamental group. So now the natural question arises as to whether this is enough to uniquely identify the three sphere. If it is, then the problem of deciding whether a three manifold in the three sphere is in some sense purely algebraic and in topology. It is always desirable to reduce topological questions to algebraic ones since the latter tend to be easier. The problem became famous in part because it was extremely hard and in part because many mathematicians gave incorrect proofs. This is often how problems become famous. If a problem in a field is hard, that indicates that the tools of the field are not adequate to easily address it. So the problem spurs people to improve those tools. It was so simple to imagine, but so difficult to prove. Ah, that was too heavy a stuff. Are you still awake? So that is all for today. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of The Saint of Mathematics. I will be back next week with the third part of this podcast. Do let me know your feedback and reaction in the comment box and don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Thibelina signing off from Physics for Students. Goodbye and stay happy.